Welcome to the Carl Jackson Podcast. This episode is brought to you by LadyArtLove.com. LadyArtLove.com is the online store that carries my clothing line, the Carl Jackson Collection. So I hope you check them out. They are the official sponsor of this episode, LadyArtLove.com. Welcome to another episode of the Carl Jackson Podcast. If you're watching on CJC Television Network, we want to thank you for watching us. And if you're listening on one of your favorite podcast platforms, we just want to say thank you. And um, we really appreciate the overwhelming um, love and support that you guys have shown us. Uh, today is a very great show. I have Paul Crouch Jr., um, who is the son of of Paul and Jan Crouch, the founders of the Trinity Broadcasting Network, which is the largest Christian network in the world. Uh, and his son is with us, Brandon Crouch. Brandon has been a guest on the Carl Jackson podcast a few times, well, one time, <laughs> I've said a few times. Um, so he's been a guest here before and uh, me and Brandon have become uh, decent acquaintances and I would even call him a friend. And so, you know, it just made sense for his father to come on the show and we uh, chop it up. Welcome to the Carl Jackson podcast. I am delighted and excited that you guys are watching us and listening on Spotify, Apple, iTunes. And if you're watching on the CJC Network, I want to say thank you for watching us every week. I mean, the numbers have been just getting higher and higher and higher. I don't know why you guys are watching my black face, but I'm very happy. Uh, today we have royalty here we have iconic uh broadcasters paul crouch jr and his son brandon crouch i gotta tell you guys a little tvn story so i've met actually <laughs> i've met paul crouch and jan crouch before they passed as a child i wow. met them three times i saw uh the first time i saw paul crouch uh it was a church in irving texas called um Calvary Chapel or Temple. Calvary and, Temple. Calvary Temple. Jadon George, I think, was the pastor at the time. I was a, a lad. And um, I remember walking up to your dad, and uh, he was surprised that people knew what TVN was because these guys had just started on cable there in Dallas. And so he was a little surprised that everybody was walking up to him after the service. He was, you could tell his face was like, wow, like he was excited. I was the first one to shake his hand. And then the second time I saw your father uh, is right before he built the studio uh, in Dallas that looked like the White House. So, <laughs> and then I met Jen, your mom, uh, after it was built, my mom went to the location and it's weird, your mom, I walked in and your mom didn't even look up. She just started talking to me as if she knew me for 50 years and telling me <laughs> the stories about how she built the set and what she was gonna do with it. And she was just had a really sweet, real faint voice. And she just kept saying, you can come anytime you want to and come. And I was like, she don't even know me. <laughs> She's talking to me. I was like 14, I guess. Yeah. So those are my memories of your family. You guys have had a significant part of, of my um, uh, Christianity. So I, I just wanted, I talked to Brandon and, I, and Brandon's been a guest on my uh, podcast. So I just wanted to have the legend on, Mr. Paul Krause Jr. Well, thank you. Thank you, Noel. Listen, you know, you can't choose which family you're born into. God kind of uh, ordained that, I think, from the beginning of the universe. I think there's a scripture in there somewhere about that. But no, it, it was an honor to kind of, you know, be raised in that atmosphere because you know, there, there's a lot of learning that that you t that takes place. You know, with any family that you're raised in, and you know, the, the one thing that I really learned from my father that that he stressed so many times was that, you know, if God is using you in any capacity whatsoever, you know, whether you're the pastor of a church or the head of a large organization, or you're just running the local YMCA, you know, in your local city, it doesn't matter. If God is using you as any in any way, it's probably because you are the least likely candidate to be chosen. Right. You know, back in the 70s, if I was going to be God and pick 
two people to start one of the largest Christian networks, I probably would never have picked Paul and Jan Crouch ever right. Right. because, you know, they were just very simple people. Dad had a little radio background and had done some Christian films. You know, mom was just a, a homemaker and, you know, they didn't have money. My parents weren't pastors. My dad was not a preacher. We weren't wealthy at all. And, and, but God plucked them out of millions of candidates but here's the key, and this is a key for you and for all, everyone watching. You know, when God calls you, he doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your good looks. He doesn't need, you know, your talent. He doesn't need this. What he simply needs is your obedience. Wow. And when God called them, they said, yes, we'll go. You know, I think dad said many times later on, had he known what he was signing up for, he would have run for the hills. Because, <laughs> you know, even though TBN had a lot of success and grew, has, uh, and it's still a very powerful network, um, the thing that people don't see behind the scenes, and you saw a little glimpse of my mom behind the scenes, they don't understand the sacrifice Ooh. that with any yes. success, there are tears, there is agony. There are hours that I would see my parents on their knees weeping saying, God, why, why, why? Uh, because with success comes struggle and with success comes uh, tribulation and turmoil and people that want to tear you down. I think, you know, a lot of people call them, haters right brother you think tbn didn't have haters oh my god i mean it was unbelievable because christianity as you know is kind of divided into these different lanes and these different denominations so if you don't do it our way then a lot a lot of people thought we were just flat out going to hell for doing right. what we're doing because we didn't preach their way didn't would talk their way so christians can be very uh, divided in, in, in what they believe, even though we all read the same Bible. Uh, so that was very hard at times for my parents. But, you know, when you get to that level of success, you've also got to have a pretty thick skin. And my dad and mom both said that they had uh, hides about as thick as a rhinoceros <laughs> because there's a lot of arrows that come at you not only from the secular press, you know, I mean, dad didn't give a hoot about the LA Times or the Orange County Register, but when a Christian quote unquote brother comes after you for something, that really, uh, and listen, I'll name names, you know, the hardest thing my dad had to deal with was an attack from uh, John MacArthur. Pastor John MacArthur out here in LA has a huge church called Grace to You, is the name of the church. But brother, I sure didn't see a lot of grace coming from his camp, if you want to be honest. And I don't care if he sees this or not. And any of you can forward it to him if you want to. I don't care. Yes, uh, forward it to him. Yeah, yeah. please. Got you, Paul Jr. Yeah, absolutely. But that's, you know, kind of the sacrifice is what people don't see behind the scenes. And we won't know till we're promoted to glory, any of us, the impact that Trinity will have had on people's lives, on the body of Christ, on people that have gotten saved, touched, healed. Even today, even though I don't work with TBN uh, at all right now, full time, I've been separated for about 10 years. You know, people still come up to me because I have the Crouch name and I'm starting to look more and more like my father every day. Just like him, man. It's um, scary. They come up to me and just, and thank me people that just literally about a week ago, a young man that had been in prison for 15 years for some stupid drug thing or something, you know, got out and he said, Paul Jr., I got saved in prison watching TBN. And now he's out doing full-time ministry, working with his church. So those are the kind of stories that, you know, you love to hear. And, uh, and, and that's why even now, I'm still dedicating my life to Christian media, to Christian service. I mean, Brandon and I, you know, with our production company, still do a lot of secular stuff and a lot of fun stuff and motorcycles and, you know, different things like that. But the side, my side of the business is still focused more on 
working with other ministries, promoting other ministries, and you know, staying uh, close, you know, close to the vest, so to speak. So I want to ask you a couple of questions, and Brandon, you can chime in anytime you know you want to. I have a couple of questions for you, Paul Jr., because I have I have like a whole list because of you're a broadcaster. So both of you guys do such great work. Um, talk a little bit about your father. I remember your dad. Uh, the second time I saw him, he was, uh, you could tell he was very focused and stressed. Mm-hmm. I remember this as a kid. I mean, I, I can't tell you what it was because, you know, I was a child. I couldn't des- describe it. But I remember I tried to shake his hand and he shook my hands nice. But you could tell he was very, very stressed. Like, yeah. you could tell that this whole, the new Dallas thing was like another taxing thing for him. Talk a little bit about that, uh, what that is, the sacrifice part. Because a lot of people look at me and what I'm doing, and then they go, they think it just comes so easy. So I want someone who's a legend, iconic legend like you, to talk about what it was like, not just seeing it from your father's perspective, but you too. Because you also, a lot of people don't know this, um, you were really the reason why TBN went into the digital world. I remember ITBN. Uh, when it first started, and I was like, whoa. And it was weird. It's like Netflix started like a little bit either before or after you. Right. You really started that. Your father started the Holy Beam on the 18-wheeler, which is what ABC and CBS and all these people use for live broadcasts. Right. But they don't see that sacrifice part. So talk a little bit about that and then pivot into the ITVN thing. Well, I I touched on it a little bit, like I said, sacrifice and bread. And you remember, you know, we would go to whatever Christmas or Thanksgiving things with my folks. You know, we, we rarely, you know, we were a close family, but dad really prioritized TBN many times over family, to be honest. Now we always got together for Thanksgiving, but he was so driven thinking that, you know, the Lord's going to return, the rapture's coming. And he was like, almost like somebody that knew we had, you know, a starving crowd and he was running out into a field trying to harvest as much food as he could to feed these starving people. And he he, he treated TBN really uh, as a sprint more than a marathon. So he was constantly... Um, pushing for the next station, the next deal, the next expansion opportunity. And he, I mean, you remember, he lived it. I mean, even at at Thanksgiving, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that, but Thanksgiving, Christmas, yeah, we'd open our presents. And then within 10 minutes, we're talking about TBN. We're talking about uh, the next station, the next thing we need to thing, or this transmitter blew up. So he's worried that we have to pay for now a new, Klystron tube or something. So you you never, he never, and I don't know, even know how you could do that. He never could step away and just be separate for a while. I mean, I think the lesson in it is he had blinders on, like the Bible right. says, you know, and he ran his race. But at the same time, there was a sacrifice that was paid. And sometimes it was family. Um, you know, sometimes it was being a father. Um, but I mean, so you look at the success, but then you also see, you, you know, you, he tended, it's like tending a garden and he tended the TBN garden so well that people saw this magnificent garden that was wonderful and everything, but other areas lacked, you know? Um, and so, you know, as a family, you, you just have to adapt and you see the success and you appreciate the success and you, and it, and it, it's wonderful, but at the same time, you know, sometimes growing up without a father, you know, is hard and difficult. And so, you know. Yeah, I, my, in my brain, I'm 61 now. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> TBN started in 1973. People don't realize it started, my parents connected with Jim and Tammy Baker. I'm sure you remember that oh, name yeah. as oh, a kid. Yeah. So, Jim had just actually gotten fired from 700 Club and Pat Robertson. And uh, so he came out to California in 72 
and connected with my dad. My dad had just left uh, a local station called KHOF, and thank you. But um, so TBN was started by Jim and Tammy and my mom and dad, kind of as co-partners. And then <clears throat> within about, I don't know, about a year, year and a half, my dad and Jim <laughs> did not see eye to eye at all, mainly over money. Right. But my dad was that tight-fisted German right. <laughs> that uh, would only pay cash for everything. You know, Jim was spending money and signing leases and things on buying equipment with money we didn't have. Yeah. So that really blew them apart. But they went east, started PTL Club. Dad stayed on the West Coast and grew TBN slower. It was kind of like the tortoise and the hare a little bit. Oh, yeah. And grew TBN slower, but grew it through buying TV stations. And that's where, you know, I don't know if your audience remembers. <laughs> I mean, he kind of does. Uh, he's a more of a millennial. But, you know, you used to watch TV by watching a transmitter uh, that sat on a mountain or up on a tower somewhere. And you had to have an – and it was wireless. I mean, that was cool. I mean, you know, everybody thinks – wireless you know is a new thing right with these cell phones wireless was how tv tv started yep absolutely. and you had a tv and you had to have an antenna either on your roof or rabbit ears or something like that and you watched tv that way and that's how tv and grew was station by station la phoenix um i think oklahoma city was next miami dallas came online later right later you know i think it was fifth, sixth, seventh station, something like that. Yep. Uh, but you had then seven or eight different worlds spinning in different cities, but where my dad was very innovative and, and he was at cutting edge, and you mentioned the uh, the Holy Beamer Holy on the 18 wheeler. I can never forget that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was my well, mom. I, she, did. She I thought it was that. But – you know, he was very innovative with satellite. That's when satellite was just starting to emerge also as a technology, meaning you're hanging, uh, you know, a TV station 26,000 miles up into space, and we would send one signal to that satellite, and then it could beam down and cover the whole United States at one time live. Now, that was really unheard of in yes. the 70s yeah. and we could link all of our stations together through satellite and that was his you know kind of cutting edge technology that he was very involved in you know as he aged out a little bit the internet and what we're using now was just starting to evolve but that technology had kind of left him in the dust a little bit he didn't understand it didn't understand kind of what, you know, the, the use was. But, you know, that's then where I stepped in, and we talked about that in a, a little bit, you know, and I, I, being younger, understood that, hey, this internet thing is not just a playground for nerds. That's what my dad always called it. But this could be used as a real tool for communication. You know, so we started playing with uh, streaming on the internet. Now, this is when you know, we didn't have broadband. It was all dial-up modems in wow. the early days. I didn't know that. You know, so you had a 64 kilobit or a 128 kilobit dial-up modem, and you had to connect through yeah. telephone lines. There are kids that don't understand what AOL dial-up sounds like. That right. <laughs> right. Right, right. Oh, that was the most frustrating thing ever. I mean, could you? Oh, dude. Yeah. <laughs> So, trust me, I remember that. Yeah, so you guys sort of remember that but, yeah. that. but we really started to experiment with streaming. There was a company, they're no longer around. It was a startup called Real Video. And they were actually sending video over a dial-up modem. Now, the picture was the size of a postage stamp. Right. And it was probably 64 bits by 64 bits. I mean, it was just barely you could kind of see in that little box an image the audio was usually okay but it was a picture right and and you could see you know you could watch it it was just really bad quality you know right. obviously compared to what we're dealing with today right um 
but where dad really got it, he, I finally convinced him. Now this was in, uh, probably early 2000 or 2001. Um, we were, we're still pushing the envelope on streaming, putting video into the internet, which was still kind of unheard of. I was in China with my father. We were visiting. We literally met the vice premier uh, in China and had dinner with him at what is their equivalent of the White House. I mean, it was a very huge honor to go to this. It's called the People's Hall, right now to Tiananmen Square. And I mean, you know, you had gar armed guards everywhere and we walked in and had this beautiful dinner at this table, you know, like out of a movie. And we met with them because China was interested in Christian television. They were interested in America. They were interested in, you know, this faith element that America was dealing with because under their previous leaders, Mao and others, they had stripped God completely from their culture. Right. You know, they, you know, they would worship, uh, you know, some of these old, uh, gods from their past, but it was just a bunch of rocks or a pile of rocks or a dragon or something. And they were dealing with some dangerous cults and, uh, and, and they wanted to know more about Jesus and Christian television. So we met with them and uh, opened some doors to get TV in there. But I took dad to what they call them there, internet cafes. It's where you could go rent a computer it was connected to the internet and you could send email mainly is what it was for in those days. And uh, I called up TBN's website. It was just a fledgling, young, very rough website. And I called up our streaming. Now it took about three or four minutes for it to finally buffer and come in. And sitting in, in mainland China, uh, I, I was sitting in an internet cafe and we were watching TBN on a little postage stamp wow. size picture through the internet. They, the Chinese government couldn't block it, didn't know about it probably at that point. I know, you know, certain governments can do things by blocking, you know, right. the internet. Geo but, yeah. yeah, but you know, he really, all of a sudden light bulbs went on in his head and he goes, Oh my God, this is a real tool. Right. That we can send the gospel and send Christian programming into communist China and with the internet. And I said, dad, once this internet thing really grows, it's going to be like a spider web that encompasses the earth. And I, I said, I don't care what country you're in. I don't care if it's North Korea. I don't care if it's Iran, Iraq, uh, Bangladesh. I mean, any country, I said, we'll be able to get the gospel into these nations because there's so many things involved that they can't block it. And that's where he really said, okay, we need to invest in this and really pull out the stops. And, we and that's when you started ITBN. And that's when ITBN started a little bit later. We kept our streaming getting better and better. We tried to stay on the leading edge of technology. Now, the leading edge can many times be the bleeding edge. So we weren't throwing, you know, good money to bad, but, um, you know, we were wise with our investment because we're donor supported. So we, we actually have to answer when we spend money to a higher power than just, you know, a board of directors. And so that is, we, we got our streaming better. We, we kept expanding it. And then, like you said, we started what was called ITBN, which was very cutting edge for the very time. Very cutting edge. It was and very it was, it was, yeah, Netflix. You should, I mean, just the back end alone of ITBN, because I was involved at, at, at a little bit at that point, the back end alone was very revolutionary. <clears throat> I mean, it, was, it, it literally was able to take programs directly from Master Control, convert those files into what 10 different file transcode, formats. it was transcoding it was all transcoding wow. automatically then uploading and then it and then the back end was a, a physical person entering in all the metadata because right. that was the biggest thing with with streaming is is okay you can put anything up on the internet but you and i both know if no one can find it it doesn't yeah. matter it doesn't right. mean anything you know your youtube videos those guys spend countless hours just learning 
YouTube al algorithms and metadata tags and all these different things just to get their stuff discoverable. Right. And so there was a lot more going on behind the scenes than just what you saw on at face value. But um, anyway. Yeah. So that, that was one of my huge projects that I finished up at, at TBN before I left. But then I left in 2012 and then have concentrated at that point more with, you know, working with some of the other Christian networks. I've worked with really almost all of them, Daystar, uh, TCT, uh, the Word Network. I mean, you know. Tell, tell them about the, like the vision that you well, heard, when that I you saw. Well, yeah, when I left TBN, and I'm not a big prophet guy. I mean, you know, I, I, I joke around. I say there's those that prophesy, there's those that prophet try, and there's those that prophet lie. That prophet lie. <laughs> and uh, so, so I take I take it everything with a grain of salt. But I, I did have one guy that I, I really trust, and he, he, he said, you know, that God had called me away for a season from TBN. And he said, I see you as like a honeybee with your knowledge, with your experience, going from flower to flower, pollinating all of these other networks with your knowledge. And this is long before I had ever really decided what I was going to do. I thought when I left TBN, I was going to go do movies with a friend of mine. We were going to go do some Christian films. But doors opened up with other networks. And, you know, from the Word Network to TCT to Daystar to... CTN, God TV, uh, Impact Network. I've, I love those guys uh, up in Detroit with the Impact Network. And so, you know, doors opened and I've just kind of gone through them and then stepped back into a role now as a producer and director of photography for uh, a lot of different shows. We're working with, I think I told you, Bishop Harry Jackson from uh, Maryland, uh, DC, uh, Hank and Brenda Kuhneman out of Omaha, but then uh, a big project that I've been working on recently, I shot it last year, and I still get my hands dirty. I mean, I'm a producer, but I, I don't sit in an office, you know, eight hours a day and just order people around. I get in the field, I get dirty, I like to shoot. I still, you know, work with Brandon on lighting and, and different location production shoots. Because you've been doing production since, I would say, mid-80s. You were doing commercials. I remember your dad talking about it as a kid. You yeah. Commercials as far back as 80s, like, like you did major stuff. Well, we did. I mean, here's the – my education was, not, was certainly not through school. I was 13 years old when TBN started in 1973. So, you know, and I talked about Jim Baker leaving. Well, Jim – took all of the talent with him. We had a director. We had a good audio guy. When Jim left TBN, they all went with him. Oh, wow. So we're stuck with nothing. Oh, wow. Uh, back at, here in, in California at TBN. So one day, Dad comes to me. Now, I had run camera. I had been around for a year. I had learned under these guys and mentored. And, you know, I was always that curious kid that had to take everything apart and see how it works. So I had run camera and, and was a very good cameraman at 13, 14 years old. All of a sudden, Dad said, by the way, Jim Baker left. You're directing tonight. Now, I had never directed in my life. So I literally that day had to go to a switcher that's as big as my desk that had a probably 300 buttons on it. And I had to learn it. I mean, it was like, just start punching. Yeah, but you only had two cameras. Well, we had, and at that point we had three and <laughs> yeah, three cameras, you know, so it wasn't that big. And we, you know, we didn't have a lot of, you know, graphics and things that we deal with today, but I still had to understand how to cut, dissolve, yep. you know, fade from black, super timing, key, timing. go to a roll in. Right. You know, this was all foreign to me, right. although I had listened to it on, on headsets you know, for, for a while. So that was my education was, you know, the kind of the school of hard knocks, like they say. And so I learned it that way. But then, yeah, in the 80s, you know, TBN really started to grow. And, but I was always that behind the scenes kind of kid, you know, shooting, directing. Lighting was something I, I learned early on. And I learned that you know, I don't care if you spend a million dollars on a camera, 
if your lighting sucks, it's going to suck. And so, you know, there was so much discussion at, at all of these uh, NRB and, you know, and NAB. We'd go to these trade shows and everybody's talking about our camera's better than this guy and this camera is better than that. And this camera's 300000 but this one's 100000 I mean, we're talking real money to buy cameras and lenses back in those days. So, um, but, you know, so we could never afford the most expensive cameras. Uh, you know, Christian Television was on a very, we were on a tight shoestring budget. Right. But lighting, I realized, I don't care how nice your camera is, if your lighting stinks, it's going to, your vi your image is going to stink. So I really you know, used to read books and I worked with, in, the, in those days you had the video guys and the TV studio guys that were doing game shows and talk shows and that. But then you had film guys that were out doing beautiful movies. They were right. doing, you know, Gone with the Wind. They were doing The Godfather. They were doing, you know, these, you're still, it's still a camera and it's a bunch of lights. And I realized, well, in our studio, it's a camera and it's a bunch of lights, but our images don't look like their images. Right. And I'm going, why? Right. And so that's where my brain went. And I realized that lighting can be an art form. Oh, and yes. Now, early days with television, lighting was strictly illumination. You know, we had to, you had to have two to 300 foot candles on a set for some of these early cameras to even make an image. That's why you had heavy makeup and people would sweat and, you know, those, God bless those early newscasters yeah. like yeah. Walter Cron Cronkite and those guys, they were sitting under 500 foot candles of light because those cameras and lenses were just so slow. Um, it'd be like shooting, you know, in an ASA of like 25 today, right. you know, is, is kind of the equivalent if, if you understand the math. Right. But uh, so that was early Christian television, but then as cameras got better, you know, we had the Ikigami came out with the HL79, if you want to ever Google that. Um, that was a revolutionary camera. It was small. It was light sensitive. And we could start going on location and doing things like the film guys had been doing for 50 years. And that's wow. kind of where I crossed over. And that's where I brought film lighting into the television world at least you know on a small level so speaking of film you have a new film coming out um i heard about it uh and i'm curious about it it's called trump 2024 a lot of people that listen to my podcast or look at my social pages or watch this on the network know that i am definitely for uh i'm more conservative in my views and in my and in my um in my thoughts but I'm curious about this movie. So tell us a little bit about it, whatever you can, about Trump 2024. Well, what's interesting is we still call them films, even though film had little or nothing to do with the actual production process. And right, right, yeah. Film was an acronym like 15 years ago. <laughs> that hangs on. Right. But uh, it is, and, and really it's not even a, a drum, dramatic film or a dramatic movie, so to speak. It's a documentary. Documentary, okay. And so... But documentaries have gained a lot of, um, you know, popularity in the last few years. There's been some amazing stuff. Oh, yeah. Out, you Absolutely. know, you know, Ken Burns kind of started that part of that, the interest with, you know, the Civil War. Right. Baseball and a lot of his stuff he was doing for PBS. But, uh, you know, now you go to Netflix and a, a third of what I see are documentaries and different things on cool subjects. But this was uh, brought about by a friend of mine. He funded it. I was one of the producers. I was the director of photography and it's called Trump 2024. What will America look like in 2024 with or without Donald Trump? And you know, whether he's elected in 2020 or he's not. And we go into a series of subjects that I think you'll find very interesting. Uh, listen, I, I didn't like the guy that much either in 2016. I mean, he's not a politician. He's not smooth. Obama was awesome. Absolutely. He, he could speak 
and orate like nobody's business. Absolutely. Or honey into your ears. I mean, the guy was amazing. But if you look at a lot of his policies, um, it was really starting to head us towards socialism. It was heading us, <clears throat> religious liberty was being threatened. Listen, under his administration, if I didn't want to bake a cake for a gay and lesbian couple, I could lose my business and, and did. In, in Colorado, you remember that case that went to trial and that poor couple <clears throat> um, lost their business because they, because of their religious views, didn't want to bake a cake for a gay and lesbian couple. So that's, and we were heading towards an area of religious liberty that was very dangerous to me, that if you wanted to preach out of the Bible in a church and wanted to talk about uh, abortion, you want to talk about, you know, this or that, uh, or same-sex marriage, you could be labeled uh, somebody uh, propagating hate speech, and you could be arrested for it. In fact, Canada had already got crossed that, that, that line, and there were pastors that were saying, you know, God ordained marriage between a man and a woman. Boom, their church gets shut down, and this guy ends up in jail because that's hate speech. Wow. That's, that's where, you know, in my opinion, we were heading. Uh, socialism, uh, you know, where you have this more government control. You know, everybody thinks socialism is freedom. Honestly, folks, it's just the opposite, and we prove it in this movie. Socialism is more control of the government. You have less freedom, and it leads to disaster. We look at Argentina that was one of the most prosperous nations in the 80s and 90s. They had money, they had uh, agriculture, they have gold, they have oil, they have re natural resources. Argentina was prospering. And then all of a sudden, they switched and went socialist. And within about five or 10 years, literally people are starving in the streets, people are dying in the streets. And we show a shot they have a big pile of their money. Uh, I don't know what, I think it's probably pesos or I don't know what their money is called, but their money had been become so devalued, there was millions of dollars of their money blowing in the street as trash because it was absolutely worthless. Uh, wow. And so that is something, if you wanna see the end game for socialism, just look at Argentina and the issue for these young people, all of these millennials and whatever the new, what's newer than a millennial, I guess. What are they? I don't know what you call them. These new kids. Alpha. <laughs> I think yeah, it's alpha. whatever. Coming out of college. You know, they all want free college. We all want free health care. We want free this, free food, free, you know, free housing. And brother, Mike Huckabee was quoted um, in the movie. He said, socialism is awesome until you run out of other people's money. Mm. And that's, that's what happens if we head down that road. I like so that. the movie deals with, you know, Trump's policies. I, listen, the guy is, he tweets stupid stuff. He's, uh, you know, he can be uh, abrasive. He can be this. But listen, I didn't elect him to be my pastor, okay? Uh, he's not the pastor of my church. He's the president, and you know, he's protecting, I think, our borders, he's protecting America, and he wants to make America great and hold on to our sovereignty, and that's what this movie explores. And when does this movie come out? It's out now. It's, it was uh, out uh, about a month ago. You could watch it on Salem Now, which is Salem Radio, but <clears throat> if you just go to our website, uh, trump2024.com, www.trump2024.com uh, you can there's a link that'll take you right to uh, you know a, a digital player uh, you it's like I don't know you, you it's like 499 or something and um, you can watch it just digitally now everybody's watching movies digitally <clears throat> because we originally were going to be in theaters but with the covid thing you know the theater thing got shut down but you can, you know, any device, you can watch it on your phone, on your computer, 
if you can stream to your TV, you know, like most people can do now, uh, you can watch it that way. And I have a, <clears throat> I have two more questions. Uh, thank you so much for doing this today. I really appreciate it. I have two more questions before I let you guys go. Sure. Um, so I want to go back to ITBN. Um, so how much of ITBN do you think of, uh, had some form of an effect on the industry itself? Because I know I don't think Netflix was doing that. What were it they? Were. <clears throat> In fact, there were no networks that were doing what we call almost real time video on demand. You know, there was Hulu was just starting up. So they were taking a lot of old shows and you could watch the office and some of the other, you know, if you'd missed an episode a, a few weeks later, you could watch it, that kind of thing. <clears throat> so they were kind of on the cutting edge, but we were way on the cutting edge because, you know, we, we were constantly getting calls. People say, I missed Joyce Meyer. I missed Joel Osteen's program. You know, young people today, and I guess all of us are spoiled, we want to watch what we want to watch, when we want to watch it, where we want to watch it. You know, I grew up in the days of you had to be in your living room at 7 p.m. if you wanted to watch Gunsmoke. Right, right. You know, or my parents were huge into, you know, like Hee Haw. There was an old show called Hee Haw. You know, but you had to have dinner, be done, and be in the living room by 8 o'clock or whatever it was. So anymore, uh, that's obviously a thing of the past. And, and so we realized, you know, even uh, for, you know, touching and affecting people's lives, we're not there to just entertain. We were there to give you meat for giving, you know, a, a solution to problems. And here was the bigger thing that I realized just – in being able to watch what you want to watch, when you want to watch it, where you want to watch it, was what do you want to watch? And that's where Brandon touched on the metadata that we were putting into the metadata of these shows, you know, if it dealt with uh, salvation, if it dealt with healing, if it dealt with marriage issues, you know, if, if it dealt with uh, loss or, or you're grieving, you know, if you if you want, if you just lost your loved one or lost a parent or a child, you know, you need help. You need a word. You need somebody to tell you something out of the Bible about that. You don't necessarily need to watch a show, you know, with a choir singing about, you know, uh, angels. You right. need something deeper than that. So with ITBN, you could search by uh, the pastor, you know, hey, I want to see T.D. Jakes. I want to see uh, whoever, you know, Paula White. You could search that way, but then you could search by subject, you know, healing, uh, death, um, Holy Spirit. You could touch on different theological things. So it brought up a, a new world where you could watch then what you want to watch and, and something that would minister to you at that moment and not just what was on the air at the time. And then, um, so I had uh, the question about, um, uh, I wanted to also go, pivot back to, or go back to the movie Trump 2024. Did you, uh, how did you shoot that for some of my tech people? Yeah, and I'm a techie guy, so I can get deep in the weeds on, <clears throat> on the tech side. Obviously, it had nothing to do with film, but we own, uh, at the time, it was called a Red Scarlet W. So it's, it's and, and I like red, you know, they're kind of a cool, uh, you know, product, but they're well made. I mean, this thing, this camera is, is built like, you know, a brick house. And uh, it was very solid because I was traveling thousands of miles, airplanes, taxis, Ubers, going in and out of hotels. You know, we shot for almost six months uh, all over the country, D.C., Dallas, uh, Florida, California, everything. But I, I like, uh, we, we, we obviously wanted to do two cameras because, you know, I love to have the relief shot, that side shot. Uh, and it was a very small crew. It was myself and uh, my partner, Dwight Thompson Jr., and his wife. And then occasionally my wife was with us. Uh, and then we maybe picked, so that was the crew traveling, uh, 
and then we'd pick up a local grip or a local gaffer in each city. Right. Uh, but we were traveling with all the gear, including the lighting, because I have a very wow. specific lighting style, especially for interviews. Uh, you know, with a large source, I use a company called Light Mat, uh, L I T E M A P T E, I think, Light Mats. They're very small, they're very. Uh, they're LED, they're bicolor, but they break down uh, very small and they're very lightweight, hence the name. Um, and then I traveled with what I call ice lights. A lot of people may know what an ice light is. It looks like a, a lightsaber that Obi-Wan Kenobi would travel right. with. <laughs> and right. uh, I think Westcott makes those. Uh, but we had uh, the red camera with primes on my main shot usually a 35 or a 50, uh, depending on the room. If I had a big room, I could use the 35. Uh, if it was a tight, like New York, the hotel rooms are very small. So we usually were on a 50. But, uh, and then a side shot, we traveled with a Sony A7S II with the 80, uh, 70 to 200 okay. with this side shot. And you'll see in the interviews, we have a very distinct beautiful front shot, you know, with the talent. And then on the dark side, I, I like to light, you know, my key side, but I want to, the close up on the shadow side. Right. And you'll see that I think very distinctly on all the interviews. And uh, that was with an A7S II uh, with the longer lens. And uh, so that's what I traveled with as we shot the interviews. And then, you know, we had the A7, uh, to go do B-roll with. If we were in D.C., we went out and shot, obviously, the Capitol and the, you know, Washington Monument and just B-roll stuff. And then I traveled even with a little GoPro on a uh, a gimbal, you know, the little stick thing with a gimbal. Uh -huh. And that was, you know, if you're walking through the mall or, you know, doing some B-roll shots through a building, you know, the GoPro was so quick. Just one click, you're up, you right. go. And for quick B-roll stuff, the quality, we shot at 4K. Everything was shot. Obviously, the red was 5K. The, you know, the A7S II was 4K and the GoPro was 4K. And uh, so that's kind of how we pieced all of the technology together. That's awesome. Um, did Brandon leave already? Has he gone? He's, he's just over here. He can step back in if you need. I needed to ask him a, a, one last question. If Brandon. Yeah. Come in. Here. He's coming. So but, I want to ask you both this question. You guys can answer. We'll, we'll close it out with this question. Um, you know, as God is moving us toward, it seems like something unique. I want to know your take on our, our times and where do you see this thing going? I want each one of you guys to answer this as we close it out. Well, I, you know, I'll tell you that, again, I'm at a different age. You're, he's in his mid-30s. I'm 60. Um, I've lived through, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, even more than y'all. But you guys, even at your age, do remember 9-11. Uh, you know, I, I go back, I remember the Kennedy assassination. I was three years old, but I remember it as a three-year-old kid very distinctly wow. when our president was shot in, you know, that motorcade there in Dallas. So... You know, and I remember my dad saying one time we were, it was right after 9-11 and we walked into a meeting and, and the airplane, you know, the airports were shut down. There was nobody flying. You know, everybody thought it was the end of the world. And dad walked in and he goes, well, I've seen the end of the world now about four or five times. And, you know, cause we had several uh, stock market meltdowns. You guys don't remember the mid nineties under Reagan. Yeah the Vietnam War, you know, I mean, obviously the Gulf Wars, a lot of people were saying even the Gulf Wars under Bush were going to be Armageddon. It was going to be the beginning of uh, the tribulation, you know, because I have a kind of a prophetic background. I used to do a lot of prophecy shows. Right. And the Bible talks about a lot about end times, the end of the world, 666, the Antichrist, all that stuff. So, you know, I'm a little more... Uh, not jaded, but I've just seen more in my lifetime. And this COVID thing is definitely the, one of the most unique things I've ever had to try to live through. 
um, and, and deal with. But I, I would say very simply this. God uses different things uh, to kind of shake up the church a little bit. I think he really does. And, uh, you know, I, you know I, I remember even the AIDS crisis back in the, you know, a few years ago. AIDS was a plague. It was going to wipe out, uh, you know, the world or wipe out, you know, a lot of, I think, ignorant preachers were calling it a plague on the gay society or gay, you know, uh, they were saying some stupid stuff like this. So, you know, I've dealt with different diseases, different uh, plagues, whatever you want to call it. But I, 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 I see better days ahead. I think God has used uh, this COVID thing to readjust the church. I think we are not going to go back to what we call normal. I think there's going to be a new normal in church, in the way we, can, we do meetings, and the way uh, businesses operate. And I think, you know, out of every crisis, there's certain good that comes out of it. Right. And I think we're going to see some readjustment of our priorities. I think it's caused some people to readjust, you know, their, their priorities with their family and realize that family time is very important and more important. Um, I, I've seen some good come out of it, even though it is a horrible, you know, plague. It's been a horrible thing. Um, it, it, in some ways, it has politicized certain things, you know, mask, no mask, you know, is it dangerous? Is it not dangerous? And we're dealing with that now. You know, even SNL, I was watching last night, you know, is just roasting Trump right now <laughs> because he ends up, you know, getting COVID, which is something that's not that dangerous and, you know, all this stuff. And I, I don't think Trump, I think Trump will be fine. Yeah. But, you know, it's just interesting how certain things get politicized as either you know this way or that way but i god is still in control i really do believe we're going to see better days ahead i think we're going to come out of this just fine just like you know even though we we pass the 9 11 anniversary every year it does not to the families that lost loved ones but it does kind of fade a little bit from our memories uh, a little bit, although obviously next year will be the 20th anniversary of that. Yeah. And I think we'll see more, uh, you know, more talk about it. But it was a horrible thing to live through. It absolutely was. But we will get through it. We are Americans. We are the greatest country in the world. We have the best technology. We have the greatest people. And our diversity in America, culturally, you know, with whatever, African-Americans, Indians, uh, Native Americans, Chinese, everybody. I have always considered that a strength of America, that we have blended, you know, these cultures from all over the world, from Europe and Africa and South America. And, and to me, it's that two-edged sword. It's one of the greatest strengths of America, but then it can be very divisive too when we see things like Black Lives Matter, and Black Lives absolutely matter. They absolutely matter. Uh, but I don't necessarily think burning cities to the ground is Yeah, that's, right. not, that's not what Black Lives should be about. Exactly. Not at all. And, and you know that better than anybody. So, uh, but we'll get through it. I've been through riots. I, I lived here in LA for the Rodney King situation. Wow. You know, and... They, you know, half of L.A. got burned to the ground as I, and it was horrible. You know, and everybody thinks that this is going to lead to the end of the world. Brother, this is not the end of the world. God is still in control, and there are better days ahead. Yeah, I mean, for me, just to kind of dovetail off him a little bit, I mean, innovation has always <laughs> thrived in pressured situations. Mm -hmm. You know, the invention, the invention of the car, the Model A, you know, the Model T car. I mean, so you go through history and you see these, these, uh, you know, chaotic times, but out of chaotic times always come, you know, with war comes innovation, comes, yeah. you know, new technologies. I mean, GPS global satellite, you know, our global satellite system was birthed out of war. You, I mean, so you go through and, and you see these crazy inventions coming out of these really tough and trying times. I mean, 
we're seeing innovations in the internet right now as people are transitioning everything onto the internet, our Zoom meetings and calls and all these different things. And so on, on one hand, technology is going to move forward. And especially during this COVID season, uh, we're seeing these companies and uh, driverless cars and all of these different things come out of, the, of crazy situations that we're living through right now. But I think as, as, as people of faith, as Christians, you know, the Bible says that we should be ready in and out of season. And if this is the end of the world, you know, end of the world, and, and we should live as if God was coming back today. So I think to, to even bring it back to my grandfather's vision, you know, he really, really put the blinders on and said, <laughs> you know, we, TBN is going to usher in the end of the world. And we're going to get as many people saved as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And so that was his mission. And he did that with every ounce of flesh and everything in him to take the gospel into the entire world. And, and, and we really, I know my dad believes this and I do, you know, that is our mission. We are, we believe that with everything that we are through every technology that we can find with zoom and, YouTube and, and internet television and everything is Christians need to step up and live as if the world was ending, you know, mm, as if like Christ that. was coming back, I like that. you know, that, that such a time as this to live our faith in action and not just sit on the sidelines and, and, and watch. Yeah. So, you know, whether that's the election, our faith, Whatever it is, we need to be active in the playing field. We need to be soldiers of Christ. We need to be winning people to Christ. We need to be preaching the gospel. We need to be telling our friends, having conversations. I mean, so that's my, my big thing is to be ready in and out of season, in COVID season, out of COVID season, whatever that means to you. But we need to be active and engaged and, and living our faith out. So, yeah, there's a scripture, it would be a good one to end with was, and it really f focused my dad and, and it's really what drove him. It's Mark 16, 15. And it was just very simply go into all the world. Oh, and, preach the the gospel. Gospel. Yeah. and you saw that brother yourself. Oh, yeah. And uh, so that, you know, and whatever technology that takes, whether it's the internet or satellite or, you know, but what we as content creators need to create, you know, stuff that, I, and I have no issue with creating entertainment and things for kids and this and that, teaching kids how to count and do numbers or whatever, or right. just a funny movie. I mean, that's great. We all need that. Right. But, um, you know, but, but I, I also try to focus on, you know, creating things that will change, touch and affect people's lives for the Lord and for good. And that's, that's my heart. So the closing this out, the what is what do you you got you both are you both are iconic men of God. I mean, I used to watch you on JCTV and I watch you on TVN. So what you guys are pioneers in my mind and in my eyes. So what do you guys see we should be doing to move uh, the culture for it um, from a uh, physical standpoint, visual and spiritual. That, what do you guys see? Well, the, the the main thing I see, and again, dealing with the techie side. Listen, twenty five years ago, you'd have to have half a million dollars in your bank account to buy a camera and to be able to do production. Right. I mean, now I'm seeing unbelievable stuff. I saw something that was so cool that Apple did. Um, shot on an iPhone, you know, right? So, there's kids, yeah. This, this is my first camera, believe it or not. Wow, it could got me so dope. ITC 350, this was $25,000. 25,000, 25,000 bucks. Oh, wow, man. yeah, this thing is heavy. I know, super it's heavy. like a weight. <laughs> well, we have this, and then. I, actually, our camera closed out my pencil, but yeah. Anyway, so but the technology now to do production is in every kid's hands. Yeah. Now, just because you you can do production doesn't mean you should do it. Right. <laughs> and you know, I liken it to 
Yeah, and here's, you know, our la this was the A7 I talked about. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, so this is obviously 4K. It yes. weighs two pounds. Yep. This does, what, 300 by 250, you know, resolution? No, it was SD. It was regular 480. 480 yeah. by 640 resolution. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, $30,000 versus three three thousand dollars yeah right. for that so Perfect. this was actually the camera i shot a lot of the trump stuff with <laughs> wow. but anyway now here's my and i talk about this a lot at different seminars and things i teach at <laughs> you know really the this right here is just a tool it's right, no right. different than a hammer right and right. listen i can or a paintbrush let's call this a paintbrush Absolutely. listen i'll i'll hand a paintbrush to one guy and he'll paint uh, the Mona Lisa with it. I'll hand a paintbrush to another guy and he'll make stick figures with it. Right, so right. it's no different. Listen, I can shoot beautiful, you know, movies, images, uh, TV shows with this. And I can go out and, you know, just shoot it and, and do out of focus shots of trees. You know, right. so that's uh, the, the tools have become almost irrelevant. There are no bad cameras anymore. Everybody we used to always argue, my camera's better than yours. This makes a better image. Dude, they're all a thousand times better than anything I used 25 years ago. Yes. <laughs> so the issue now becomes, and post-production, I mean, the, the first Avid, a nonlinear system I bought in our other production company was $125,000. And to be able to do non-linear editing was just mind-blowing uh, in that day. So, because uh, I started with two three-quarter inch machines that would only go edit to edit, you know, cut, this cut, old, cut. School. old school, baby. Um, it's almost like the Stambeck when you the film almost. It's almost like- It really like was, very similar. It came yeah. out of that concept. Right. Um, so anyway, but but, the tools are accessible to everybody. Now it's a matter of getting a good story, uh, getting uh, something that, that people will watch. And, and now we can create, there's, it, we're not in a thousand channel universe anymore. We're in a million channels. I mean, as you know, there's guys out there that barbecue meat and have 200, 300,000 followers. Yes. I watch those all day long. <laughs> I do too. I'm into it, dude. I didn't yeah. tell you. I didn't you know, <laughs> Brenda is watching, you know, my wife decorating shows on how to decorate and how to do this and that. So there's sub channels for everything now. Uh, guys go out and blow stuff up, you know, with guns and TNT and all that stuff. And they have thousands of followers. So uh, content, they say, is king, but distribution is still emperor. So just remember oh, that. Say that again, brother. <laughs> yeah. Content is into, king. I got into distribution, so say that again. Yeah. Content is king, and it's needed, but distribution is emperor. And so remember that, because uh, now we're creating needles that we're throwing in haystacks. And, and you know, your content may be the greatest content in the world, uh, but if you can't find an audience for it, then it's then it's wasted. So that's you know, the tools are, are much more accessible. That's great. It's brought a lot of young uh, kids. I mean, I watch some of these YouTube videos of people reviewing lenses. You know, they'll grab a lens and they unbox it and, right. you know, blah, 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 blah. I think the unboxing videos are stupid, by right. the way. <laughs> if you can't get your lens out of a box, brother, you, you're, in the wrong, you're in the wrong business. But, you know, he did a Komodo unboxing the other day that I thought was so stupid. <laughs> but um, anyway, but some of these kids are great. There's some Asian guy that talks about new cameras and jibs and things. Right. And, you know, he's funny and he's very informative. Uh, some of them are pretty lame, but th there's some very good ones out there, too, of, you know, how to learn. And you can learn television on YouTube now. You yeah, can learn yeah. to edit. You can I'm learn to shoot. You can learn... After Effects, you can learn graphics, you can learn, you know, lensing, all of that stuff. I mean, I think to just to end it or to dovetail, you know, off that is there's no excuses anymore. Right. 
there's no excuse not to learn. There's no excuse if you want to be a, you know, a DP or if you want to get into film or any of that, there's just no excuse. You don't have an excuse. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough this. If you have a laptop and an internet connection, you can learn how to shoot and edit and light and do everything that you need to do. But here's a key, and this is what the millennials don't want to do. Television is a lot of hard work. Yeah. It's a lot of right. carrying heavy cases upstairs. Right. It's a lot of yeah. dirty out in, in the beach with the wind blowing in your face. It's a lot of heavy lifting. It's a lot of, I need that 80 pound light from there. I need it over there. Uh, you know, so a lot of kids want to be Steven Spielberg. Right. But they don't want to put in the, work. To put in the work. And television, you know, everybody wants to just go plop a tripod in the room and say, well, let's shoot it there. Right. Listen, the better shot is not there. The better shot is if I walk up the stairs and go here. Right. And, and get some separation. But you've got to be able to move that camera, move the lights, work your butt off because television is not, you know, a white glove industry. It can be a down in the dirt. Listen, I shot, I've sh literally shot for 40 years at what we call the, a skid row mission. Fred and Willie Jordan have a mission up in downtown LA. Yep. They feed hungry people. They feed uh, children and men and they, they, so we do a show to let people know what's going on. Dude, if you saw all the c camera cables and stuff I've had peed on, crapped on, oh, you know, wow. stuff that's been stolen. Wow. I've almost gotten hit in the head with a brick by oh, some wow. guy that didn't want to be filmed. It is dirty, hard work wow. to do shows like that. But, uh, you know, we all have to look at the, the greater purpose and, uh, and, and that's, you know, what, I, what we've talked about this whole podcast. Thank you guys so much for doing this podcast. If I have to add my little two cents to end this, I'll just <laughs> say these guys are basically telling you all to learn your craft and follow God. That's it. Learn your craft, follow God. I think that the biggest mistake I see a lot of young people make my age and younger is they want to be seen. They want the name. They want the 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 highlight of life whatever that is red carpet stuff but um the work the grind the grind i mean you guys are still grinding look these guys are iconic and they still grind like they just started yesterday like do you get that so i i'm just so thankful that you guys um, did my podcast and i hope you guys come back have some stuff you want to promote whatever Appreciate you guys doing this. This is the Carl Jackson Podcast. You guys be blessed. I hope you enjoyed my guest today. I enjoyed having the conversation. It was a wonderful conversation. And, uh, you know, this is one of our special editions. This has been an amazing uh, year in terms of our guests. Season four and our special edition um, episodes have been phenomenal. I've been just like totally happy with how uh, this season uh, has gone. So uh, until next time, you make it a great and prosperous week.